first really obvious question for you is, you know, why did you become a teacher? Um, oh, uh, I uh, keep. I'll keep it simple. Uh, I love design or drawing. Yeah. Uh, so design technology, to be specific, and I liked kids. So I had good relation as a sixth former. I, I liked. I had my natural ability to interact with students uh, and younger kids was uh, really evident and my uh, head of design technology, so my teacher at the time said, you know, this is probably his first A level year, uh, you, like, you like DT, you like kids, why not be a teacher and that was it. So what happened in my second year of sixth form was he put me, when I was free, uh, into year seven classes to teach lessons, so we did a plan and had a little project. And I really liked it. And then there was a, a mock interview uh, to kind of prepare for the university uh, interview process. So it was a four-year Bachelor of Education at Goldsmiths College at the time. Uh, and that's how I got started. And you know, four, year, uh, four years of six to eight week teacher placements in four different schools all around South East London. And that was it. Brilliant. Yeah, so Mr. Baldy. So, Mr. Baldy. Yeah, Paul Baldy. Yeah. I still keep in touch with him now, actually. At um, Goldsmiths? No, he was head of design technology at Fleetwood High School up in Lancashire, Blackpool. Oh, yeah. uh, and he's around Chorley area up in Manchester now. But it was nice because a while ago he found out I'd won an award and sent me a message through an email. And I think he's got my book and yeah. follows me on Twitter. So it's lovely. So that's, that's, every teacher's got a great teacher story. And, and mm. that's, it was Paul Baldy who got me into it. So maybe then you could talk us through about how you became, you know, the most successful educational blogger um, that that's out there at the moment, and how uh, you and the, the kind of genesis of teacher toolkit right. and, and 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 that sort of thing. So teacher tool, I, I've been tweeting since two thousand and seven or eight, personally, and then there was a time when it. The teaching tweets started to interfere with my personal, I'm having a beer, I'm playing with my son kind of tweets. So at that point, it was about 2010 when I really was getting into Twitter in the classroom professional, I thought I've got to make a professional uh, decision here. So I created, I created a few accounts, one for a classroom which was for kids and it was locked down, and another one for me personally which is Teacher Toolkit which was a pure it was an interactive channel, but my mission was to just be interact an output channel, and it was just all about teaching full stop. Pretty much what tweeting is, it's what status updates, what I was doing. But gradually, it became a bit more deep and meaningful, and so that's how it started. And, and my logo actually started with a keep calm, carry on uh, symbol, and as it got gathered speed into the thousands of, and then towards ten thousand people, I thought, well, I need to, copyright issues might come into it, so I then found a photograph, inverted it, kept with a red background and, and put, just put teacher talk on oh, well, I never teacher talk when I first created the account. So that's how it started, but the writing and the blogging came in 2011. I've always loved writing and I always had a creative imagination, but I've never known if I've been good at it because I struggled with English and reading as a kid. Uh, and I still do today. Uh, but it started when my son was born in hospital in 2011 we were at 85 miles away, uh, so he was born premature three months early, he was one pound nine, life and death, etc. Uh, so three months, so there was really poor reception and to try and communicate every kind of key decision with family was just hard work, never mind the emotions. So throughout this eight or ten hours would be there every day, I just started to go on Blogger to start with on my phone and just type notes to, it was very good therapy. And, it was a great way to get home and reflect on the doctor's notes and publish it to my family. And because it was a raw story, life or death, I knew the risk of that, but it gathered momentum and you know it went up to 150,000 hits very quickly. And the baby charities and people got hold of it and that led to contributions in different books over time. But I started to enjoy it and not necessarily the live but there was a stage probably 30 days in where Freddie was going to be safe uh, where I could start to enjoy the writing and updating and I was getting lots of feedback and I thought well this is great let me apply it to my teaching so I started a teacher blog as well uh, and it was it wasn't very passionate at the time it was just kind of trying to think of stuff to do uh, or things to talk about and eventually I found WordPress which was a better platform for making it 
work smarter. Uh, and then I just made a real focus on everything teaching, the things that I'm doing, reflecting. And through Twitter, I was getting lots of feedback. So the blog allowed you to express much more. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I did, and it's you know in the two years now I've done it, it's uh, 1.3 or 4 million hits, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And the opportunities, you know, this here now or the book or House of Commons, uh, being requested for X, Y, and Z, it's just because I'm blogging. And anyone can do it. I strongly believe this. But yes, if there's a time commitment, yes, you've got to have a passion. But more, I think probably success is because I've made, with my design experience, a bit of theory, I've created my own brand, mm -hmm. or my own kind of strategies, and I've learned ICT skills through my own doing, I, you know, I've got a grade F for ICT as a GCSE student, uh, uh, but I've, I've learned, and I guess mm -hmm. that's resilience, isn't it, uh, to a degree, so that's the story, that's how I started writing. Mm. And I suppose also to add is that you are trusted, aren't you, above most people for good advice about how to be an effective teacher. I mean, I was, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that. Um, originally, I didn't do it without... I put, I put thought into it, mm. but I didn't put thought in terms of the... Or, well, that's a lie. Obviously, there was a be an audience because I'm putting it online for people to download. But in mm. the very beginning, when I was using the TES, it was this is really nice. Let's just share it, and and that's it. But with the power of social media, you can spread a document online much further than you you mm. maybe could have in the past. So there's that issue, and then as the audience has grown, there's the more thought has been required because. I do see myself as, although I'm an individual, mm. and some people do think Teacher Toolkit is a brand or a company, I just see myself as an individual just sharing ideas. And because of the immense and wide range of feedback from around the world that I get, I have to put much more thought into, you know, that the one on the screen there, I, you know, I've just thought about its presentation, can anyone understand it, uh, how will it be used, where am I going to put it on? Will there be a blog to explain the theory behind it? And just look, at, I mean, I found another website that comes up with nice, interesting fonts, for example. So I don't see it as uh, anything unique. Uh, I love how things appear, uh, being a designer. Uh, I love thinking about visual, you know, the visual quality of a document or a resource. Uh, so I think those are a factor. Uh, so I, I can't answer the question yeah, I don't yeah, know the yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think there's lots of parts of it. I think it's investing in the time. It's like anything you do if you're writing a book or writing an essay. You invest in the time, you refine it before you put it out there. If you get feedback, you tweak it. Uh, I suppose I've learned what works or what people want because people don't want to read a thousand pages because they, well, mm. unless they deliberately are seeking something like that, such as a huge book. But if they, mm. you know, teachers are busy people, so they want something quick. Something that they'll know that will work, and something that they'll know will work from someone who's used it. Yeah, I think that's probably the the key thing. So because of all the, you know, the power again of social media, if people are speaking to each other behind the scenes without me being involved in sharing things, then that's validation that it is mm. successful. And you know, with again with the teacher toolkit icon and everything, people know instantly where to go and ask and. Mm -hmm. I would like to think that 99.9% .9 of tweets that I get, I do respond to if people want mm -hmm. clarification or help. And I think that's also, a, it's a trusted source as well. And I think that's, I, I would like to think that all my followers know that they'll get that back. And it's hard to keep up, but when I was saying to you earlier before we started that, you know, I might not be able to manage everything, so I'll either find some ICT tools to help me cope with that or save things for another day and respond later uh, when I've got a bit more time on my hands. But it, you know, it does. These things do impact on you know work to a degree. But you obviously have to you know works first. But uh, it does impact on home. So I just have to adjust when I, when I do do things and when I shouldn't. Uh, and that's been a lesson learned. And you know, 
I wouldn't be, deny that you know, I've been in the doghouse with, <laughs> with my wife and ignore my boy, but I'm, I'm learning to deal with that because as the audience increases, uh, the demand has increased as well and I have to be very, very careful that it, it doesn't consume me and there has been many times where I feel it has. So I've just been more ruthless for myself uh, that through, the, again, the social media you know, epoch, I can share something at any time and it will, you know, with the audience and the power of retweets and blogs and staggering or buffering various content. There's no rush to get it out there because people will share it for you or people might not be wanting to look at it when you want to share it. So there's all these clever tools that can stagger content out and so there's less, there's less panic to get things out because I've found a lot of times I've wanted to share an instant idea but there's a time for reflection, consolidation and I think of my blog, I've got about 35 articles in reserve because I'll think of something and I'll tweak it and I'll revisit it or I'll, I'll have missed a boat in terms of the season it should be so that could be something for the future or it might fit in with another topic at another point so that's just something I've learned over the last two years mm. and that's a nice strategy to keep in mind actually Very good and I suppose a bit of a tricky question but off the top of your head you know what, what would be the sort of key advice you would give for teachers to kind of just improve their practice, and you, you know, uh, and kind of in the classroom or through uh, either anything. just stuff that maybe just off the top of the head that uh, really strikes you as important. Well, I'll, 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 I'm a firm believer in oh, my two kind of catchphrase, I suppose, is you know, I'm not the same teacher I was 20 years ago to what I am today, I certainly wasn't the same teacher I was last term, and the reasons are because I've, I am open to feedback, I'm reflective, I'm constantly thinking about how I can get better. I don't think perfection exists, I don't think outstanding exists every day, but you can, I found a nice quote the other day, I forgot who it was, but excellence is a habit, and I want to strive to be excellent as much as I can, and all the time, and I think that's maybe might be the difference between being, you know, a teacher who I have been in the past where I just turn up do my bit and go home to using the time that I have to think more about it and not necessarily impact, you know, it does impact what I do today at home but you, know, you rewind 10 years ago as a busy head of department I still was the same person thinking about all my ideas for the department all the time so I think that's probably just me and my quality or my characteristic uh, and not everyone will be like that, but my kind of key messages will be to always observe other teachers, always visit other schools because it's the best CPD you can have, and to always get people into your classroom beyond your appraisers and sometimes beyond your colleagues to, to get some mm -hmm. neutral feedback and to work hard at having you know a clear focus, plan your lessons together, observe together, observe each other, and then review and reflect and have, you know, really it goes into this kind of lesson study model or a good in ten program which I've kind of created myself before lesson study started to to gather wind here. Uh, and it's nice to know that I'm on the same page. It, it all boils up down to triads and co-planning, co-observing, co-reflection. And that's and that's key. And the the only kind of debilitating factor will be schools not giving teachers the time to do it regularly or consistently and that's key so you know that's a time and money money issue mm. uh, but I was on the conversation today with gov my governors and it's not really I mean if you take a member of staff off timetable for a week it's a thousand pound in cover and send them off with their class their form class to go and observe their lessons in their own school for a week think of that time you will give that member of staff to see all lessons around the school to reflect about great ideas they see or to not some great ideas and to reflect about their own practice or the kids that they teach in other areas and see how those kids interact. That, I mean, it's a great idea. I don't know how feasible it is, but that would be incredible CPD for your teachers. So, and even if you reduce it to one day and, and, and calendar it, you, you're giving staff real opportunity to see teaching beyond their own classroom mm. uh, and see what the kids' diet is uh, mm. in your school. So there's loads of ideas, but I think the, the pinnacle will be the reflection, the reflection part of a teacher to know that you can always do a little, 
not better, but you can do it differently to kind of open doors and break down barriers and things like mm. that. So I suppose it's very much a kind of cooperative model that you're yeah. talking and, about. And and that you know. involves it's pretty much what I've been working on today. That it's not just the teacher, that involves the kids. Mm. Uh, and you know, your your audience are the students mm. and they should have a say and they should they should be able to be part of that process. And there's a time and a place where you want to have them in rows and in silence and tests and didactic and repeat, repeat. There is a time and place for that. There's also a time and place where you want students to lead their own learning uh, and for them to feed back into your planning and, and then to give you some critique. But, you know, some of us might not be open to that and I've been in situations where I, I don't. But on the whole, I think staff don't build it into their planning enough to take the student views They'll plan for the students, but they won't necessarily ask the kids what they thought about it. Mm -hmm. And some of the best lessons I've observed, uh, you know, with teachers over a long period of time, have asked kids for their ideas, have given them feedback, and then have actually implemented what the kids have wanted. Mm -hmm. And it's just really evident to see that there's good quality teaching and learning going on in that classroom because the kids have had a say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and there's other things like data, looking in books, and typicality and support, which is your routines. You know, so if I observed you f for, a, dare I say, a one-off lesson, mm -hmm. I need to make sure that I'm looking at progress over time. So I'm looking at what's typical. So are the kids lining up because it's something that you always do, or are they putting their hand up and saying, "Sir, why are you doing that?" Because Mr. McGill's here. They, these are all the signs that you'll pick up when you gather observational mm -hmm. experience and. You know, all teachers can get to that stage, mm. but they need to have the opportunity to go and see teachers in their own schools yeah. uh, to get to that kind of level. And where where do you stand? I mean, you know, as much talk about the sort of competitive model for education, we talked about the cooperative, but you know, teachers sort of performance related pay and things like that. You know, what where, what what are your thoughts on that uh, in that context? It's a it's a, uh, I haven't formed a real opinion yet. Because I've worked in schools where standards have been incredibly low and things have been put in place where performance has improved and I'm not saying money has been a factor but you know clear consistency, clear policies, there's other things that will raise standards so you could call, almost call that an open process rather than a closed process which is your data or your, or your money. Uh, and it's going to be new to us all, but I think what has helped is the, the condensed and clearer teacher standards. I really do think they have helped. Uh, and there's been lots and lots of change, far too much for us all to keep up with. Uh, and I think we need to slow down, and I think policy makers and government, there needs to be something fixed into whoever comes into power, where they can't change X, Y and Z for a certain period of time until it is properly evaluated. But. Uh, to answer your question, I'm erring on more of a no than a yes. And I, but you know, to be a respected profession, we have to, you know there's a good what 80 billion to pluck a figure out there that that we have that's within the economy that's put aside, and we have to be accountable. And if we want to be respected, we have to show that we know our stuff and we should be qualified. Uh, to gain that credibility, and we, we have to fight all the media and the the kind of poor headlines and things like that. But, and I, I, I'm trying to get to the key part of your question. I think you can reward staff in other ways. So for example, where I'm working now, we have a, so a kind of a recruitment and retention kind of, I know that's died a death, but it's another way of giving staff a pocket of cash that they can bid for to aid their professional development. It's voluntary, it's not forced. Uh, some people use it, some people don't, but it's for their professional development. And it's a nice way of saying to staff, you've completed a term or completed a year or you've been working here for five, so it's per annum, so uh, you've been working here a long amount of time. Uh, and staff have been putting in requests for some digital devices that they can use at home or, or in school or to pay for flights to go to a conference in another country. I mean, if I was much younger and 
uh, not a committed family man, I would be off to Sweden and Finland and go and see what it's all about and go and visit some schools. Uh, and it's nice to know that my school would support me with some flights or, or some accommodation. And to think of the schools where I've been in where I've wanted to improve my practice, I've wanted to complete a master's, and they've been very stingy with the money that they've given me to aid my professional development. I've left feeling a bit aggrieved and a bit miffed off that it's been such a battle that I wanted to commit back to the school some action research. Uh, so that's not really answered the question. I think we do need accountability. Uh, you know, performance related pay across the board, I'm not sure. But certainly when you get to your threshold, you know, what we've been used to, I don't think it should be automatic where it has been for many years and, and that's how I've evolved and been institutionalised as a teacher. But at the stage where it does get to threshold where you, and I, I don't want to, you know, the tick box culture is a danger as well, but where you can properly evidence some, you know, hard data, some progress, some professional development, then there is a case that that might be needed. Uh, you know, because ultimately, you know, it's public funds. We're working that we're a public service, but you know, I put my difficult union hat on. I, I'm paying my mortgage, and I've got a life that I need to, you know, bills to pay, uh, and you know, I'm getting berated, and I've got to do this, this, and this, and I've got a 90% teaching timetable X, Y, Z. I turn up to work, I do a good job every day, uh, and. I deserve to be re rewarded. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the other issue with are we being, being paid uh, in line with other graduates and other careers? I don't think we are. But again, it goes back to the credibility, the accountability, and a bit of you know data and X, Y, and Z. And then perhaps we might be in a position to argue. A higher inflation pay rise or, or whatever or you know so I know there's been lots going on working conditions but I'm in a, a, a leadership salary now and I've never been so skint in all my life mm -hmm. and if I think just back 10 years ago where there was a bit more money around in the schools I'm not saying money was thrown at me but it was certainly thrown at me as a head of department where I had the opportunity to spend and invest in staff and facilities and the kids and it was it was happier times and Happier times professionally for spending and working conditions, and I was busy and the, you know the usual squeeze on timetables and things like that. But I was happier personally. I am happier today, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but uh, financially, it's it's harder. You know, I, I can't. You know, 2014. You tell me anyone who's better off today. I think the answer is going to be no. Uh, and maybe moving on from that, is it really the very exciting and free market world that you're entering with, with selling your resources? I mean, maybe you could talk a bit about that and, and explain, you know, how that's come about. You know. uh, so the blogging read to uh, an editor at Bloomsbury Publishing to get in touch and say, I want to rebrand the book. So it was a 100 Ideas brand. and. I wasn't going to say no, I thought great, yeah, because writing a book was never a dream, but writing was, uh, so blogging was keeping me very happy. So this is just a nice validation that it, it was working or it was it was well received on the other end. And uh, So I grabbed that and, and as I told you earlier, uh, I wrote my first book within a few months uh, and got it out for the start of the last academic year. and. Having had lots of meetings, of planning meetings, I've seen statistics. You know, within a year, it's already, you know, I can't remember the exact data. It's in the top five of education books over the last number of years per sales, and that's again a nice validation. But I was happy to write a book, you know, without getting into too much detail and not setting Bloomsbury. Uh, they make a handsome penny, so I've learned contracts and things like that, and I'm. I, They've, I've had several companies come to me and ask me for books, uh, but again, I, I'm a teacher, I'm a senior teacher, I've got a job to do, books impact on my home life, uh, so I've refused a few and I've just stuck with Bloomsbury with what I know for now and I've got two more contracts with the possibility of writing my own series, 
and there's opportunities to have a teacher toolkit app and things on the iPad, I'm not quite sure yet, but that's all been discussed. So that's really exciting. Yeah. And then you get to a point where, you know, writer's block and what am I going to talk about and things, but again, I'm just going to come back to I'm writing about what I'm doing and my passion. If, if that helps other people, then great. So there's all that, and there's the other side is all the resources. So traditionally I've put things online, uh, and I've had fingers burn, and as you get, you know, with the power of social media, I'm getting to that stage where I have to protect myself to a degree with licenses and ownership, and having put things on the TBS and have, having them removed or my moral or intellectual property taken away from me, I've started to self-host, and and that's then led to all sorts of stories and me then having the option to sell my own resources to to help you know the financial difficulties we've experienced in the last three or four years at home uh, and also to to pay the petrol and it's not the the only solution I will always share my thoughts and tweet and support because that's the inerit call uh, characteristic of a teacher to support colleagues to support kids to share and and to exchange ideas freely but I'm getting to that stage where I will always do that, so you know, don't get me wrong, but I'm at a stage where there's some things that are really hot property and there is a penny to be made and when companies approach me to do X, Y and Z, they're making a buck, so why can't I? So uh, there's been lots of kind of ad hoc negotiations and deals along the way and there's been lots of decisions made well no I'm not doing that this is mine I'm going to do that and then that's led to Selfie for example where I want to sell a resource uh, but the, you know the five minute lesson plan has been quite a journey because a lot, a lot of people it's going to go digital next term so people will be able to a small little iPad program where they can tweak the headings and make it content for themselves and then it will save as a PDF and they can print it and it, because it's online they can email it to whoever or save it as evidence for a performance related pay whatever 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 so there's that option but then at a deeper level if they really get into that or it gets to a site license level for a school that a pay option then comes in so that's great for the company but at what point will I make a penny to pay for my petrol one month and not struggle financially because Mm. teacher conditions and the pinch on pensions puts me in a predicament. I think you are at the forefront of something a lot of teachers are going to face in coming years so that you've got many teachers with amazing ideas but at the yeah. moment effectively are giving them away for free aren't they yeah. on the TES side. No absolutely. You know, and, and maybe I don't know is it any any thoughts on that really? I mean, not everyone will be able to do it. You know, yeah. everyone's got different different circumstances. People don't have time. I don't always have time, but I do make time to think about ideas and where to put them. But with the World Wide Web as it is today, teachers can do it for themselves. And I guess Teacher Talk it is a real great story of doing it for yourself. And it then opening so many doors to, I mean, I've actually lost count of all the opportunities. I mean, mm -hmm. next week I'm going to the Education Reform Summit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Michael Gove, Tristan Hunt, Boris Johnson will be there at St. James's Palace. I mean, I'm just a normal guy mm -hmm. who's doing something that I love. And there'll be thousands and thousands of teachers who have that same attitude that they love what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they can do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, your cynic might say, well, you need a bit of ICT skill, you need to be able to have something to share. You know, there's all that. But is, there, is there room, I don't know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, is there room for more of a teacher kind of cooperative thing that, you know, perhaps the unions and other organisations haven't really... No, there's not been much thought. I mean, the unions could do much more yeah. uh, grassroots. I mean, I, I've engaged through SLT chat with the DfE, Ofsted and Ofcol through a Twitter channel where they're taking part and my blog has not significantly done anything but has I've seen Ofsted documents and proofread them and contributed before they went to print for the rest of the teaching profession and that's a result of blogging or Twitter channels and there's been a few others that have had that and, and now we see the DfE and whoever else 
having round table discussions with, you know, it might appear to be quite ad hoc and I'm, I still get frustrated that there's never many teachers involved in the process. Mm. And there might be a reason for that, one either they're not on Twitter, you know, and a lot of teachers aren't, and there's a lot of teachers that do, that do not blog, that's a real minority. And then there's teachers that actually don't care, they just want to come teach, go home, be with the family, that's fine. Or there's teachers that might not be experienced enough and not, not know what to say. Rewind 10 years, I wouldn't know what to say and challenge policy, but I'm in an experienced position now where I can, which is maybe why I'm invited to a round table. Uh, so teachers can do it for themselves. Uh, union leaders are far behind. They've not quite engaged with, you know, I've had a few party you know, politics engage with me and ask me to write blogs and X, Y, and Z. So, but in terms of Twitter and a regular, you know, let's see the unions engage with grassroots teachers. They say they might survey their their members and things like that, but it's always it's not necessarily for grassroots CPD. It's mm -hmm. more you you hear all the other side of the working conditions, which is important, and the strike decisions, which is important, but not about teachers doing it for themselves, taking you know taking stranglehold of their development and how their union can support them. That, that's just one story, but teachers can definitely do it. Uh, do it for themselves. We don't need huge companies uh, you know, having a stranglehold on the whole market. Th those times have changed, and I think lots of companies are starting to... Some are starting to realise that, and they're starting to have to change their terms and conditions, or their resources or the facilities, you know, and spoken to a lot of people who do contact me regularly to say, can we do this or can you do this for me? And I look at the value of it for me as a teacher, uh, or the value of me kind of investing my time, or the financial reward even. Uh, yeah, and it's a real, it's, we're a real kind of tipping point, I think. Mm. And I think we will, re it will be one of those things that will naturally evolve through online Social mm. media, I think, more than anything. Because it potentially it could be very emancipatory. I mean, yeah. in terms of you know the hole in the wall thing in India and the, the globalization that your resources are available to someone in in yeah. the farthest reaches of yeah. the earth, just as long as they've got I mean, internet my, connection. I mean, that five minute plan has last count was 141 countries around the world. It's been downloaded and used. Uh, my blog is about 170 countries. It's been read. Uh, so, you know, anyone can do it, mm. and it is, you know, a, a freedom call for all teachers. Because if I suddenly found uh, something inappropriate or some case study stories, put it on my blog, it, it spreads, it goes viral, and then all of a sudden, Ofsted or whoever have to think, hang on a minute, and and those those stories have happened. And the more people that do it, the more teachers can change policy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's key. So I'll kind of finish that answer on that, really. Yeah, and, and finally, just, you know, obvious question, where next, you know, for you, or, you know, what you want? Uh, well, uh, I've got a new job as deputy head at Quinton Kinder School, which I'm really excited about. Uh, great we have body of staff, uh, great kids, uh, brilliant head teacher who, are, who I've known in a, another school. Uh, so he's going to do some great stuff. Brand new building, and as a design technology teacher, I I went on a tour around the other day, and I was I was trying my hardest to keep calm. Uh, you know, environment is a significant factor in kids. You know, you can learn anywhere, but an environment will make you really want to be at work as a teacher, and it'll certainly want to make the kids stay in school for longer periods of time to do homework and learn to the best that they can. So that's really exciting, uh, and I guess that's going to be, you know, X number of years doing that. And who knows? Who knows what will happen? Head teacher is on the radar. Uh, the words of Stephen Drew, who, who's on Twitter and on TV now you know, through Education Essex, he he said you've got to be 100% ready. Uh, you've got to have no doubt in your head. And I don't have doubts. I just know I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, I suppose, one doubt, but that is the only doubt. I, I do think I would do a good job, I do think I would do it passionately and uh, love leading staff and love leading kids in the community, uh, but I'm not ready to do that yet. I've got lots to learn still, and 
with the writing and the blogs that they're they're great and they're a huge distraction. Uh, and then I'm getting lots of requests to speak at events, so I've been invited to McGill University of all places right. in Montreal next February to talk about my book and lead an inset. And again, that's great. Uh, it's kind of affirming, but it's a huge workload. You get a nice bit of cash, but then you have to tell the tax man, and then you know after all the calculations, you kind of think, is it is it worth it? So. <laughs> There's that, there's that discussion as well, but it's great to get out and, and talk to people and share your ideas and you know if you can pay your petrol once a month for a, then that's great, but that's a huge extra bit of work as well. So you've never sort of contemplated just giving up teaching or going part time well, uh, or something? Three yeah. years ago I was made redundant before I started my current job, so uh, I took voluntary redundancy knowing I was going to become a father and then unbeknownst to me, uh, my boy was born three months early, so I had garden leave, which was handy, uh, really quickly, and I had six months out, and I won the Guardian Teacher Award a good ten years ago now, and I used that as a means to get into the garden and say, look, I won this award, everyone else seems to Phil Beadle and whoever else seems to be doing loads of great stuff, can I start writing? So I showed them some travel articles I'd written, I'd showed them my son's blog that was spiraling out of control, and I got my first article. It was, I think, it was about it was about redundancy actually, coping with redundancy. It was called, uh, and it was written on the f kind of first week of September of me reflecting. I'm not in school for the first time ever in 20 years, uh, and that's how that started. So writing was a great part of it, uh, and at that point, three years ago, when I was made when I was made redundant, I contemplated becoming a consultant or stepping back from teaching full time, full time, and. I don't know what, well I do know what stopped me, I wanted to be in the classroom, mm -hmm. I wanted to be in a school, I love the structure, I love the day to day interaction with the kids and the staff and all the ideas and still I'm in a nice position now, I'm in, I can have the best of both worlds, I can speak at events, I can blog and share mm -hmm. to the world and I can be in a school, in a safe environment, 9 to 5, well not 9 to 5 job, <laughs> Uh, nine till nine, John. <laughs> uh, but with a nice group, group of staff and great kids, and do what I love. And I suppose mm -hmm. that's. Do you find the kids, uh, or the st you know, how how do the kids and staff react to to your celebrity status? Yeah. See, I, I don't, I never see see myself as a celebrity, yeah, but, yeah. but I have. I have been in situations where I've seen people kind of double looking at the corner eye and saying it's. I can see by the reactions they're thinking that of me, and I always feel a bit awkward about it. And I just want to come and say hello, and I'd say, look, yeah. it's Ross from Teacher Toolkit. You can do it too. Uh, and I've been at, I've been at conferences, I've been at CPD events. Uh, people saying on Twitter, oh, thanks for replying, or emailing me saying, I know you're busy. And uh, but strangely, when I went to my new school, that was the first real time I've been in my own school environment where there was that bit of reaction and it was a bit embarrassing but mm. I'm, I'm just Ross I'm just doing my thing and I just want to share I don't th I, I found ad hoc and my current school staff have read articles and I think they know that but we're quite just down to earth here we just get on with it and you know you're a member of staff someone might discover something online and it's mine and, and they'll say oh I saw that and, and that's cool but then there's the other side where Oh, it's Ross <laughs> So that's a bit weird, but uh, you know, two or three years down the line, if that's happening, God help me in ten years' time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, it's going to be crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah. And there'll be a lot more people as well, because there's definitely a Twitterati, and then there's a definitely a. I, I do. A negative side is I do see a Premier League evolving and then a Championship, on social media. Yeah. And that could get quite dangerous, but. I think if we all, you know, all the other Twitterati that comes to your head as well, if we all keep humble and remember it's grassroots and we're there to share and just we're blogging and expressing mm. our opinion and we might have a, a, you know, I started off with a hundred reads a day, mm. very humble and I, I, I carried on regardless because there was a one person we knew and I got a bit of feedback and that was it. and. Mm. It's just gone. It's just gone crazy, and that's a nice validation. But it's not the reason why I do it. I'm just 
Mm. I'm just doing a bit of therapy, really. I'm, I'm writing and I'm sharing some ideas, and now I'm in a stage where I can get instant feedback. Mm. And that's what it is, because I can improve my classroom practice, improve my leadership, and it benefits the school, mm. and it benefits people elsewhere. And I think that's, that's what's brilliant about it. Mm. Uh, why should all, everyone should do it, and, uh, and you shouldn't give up.